as is tradition, I guess I need to open this uh, with a joke. And actually, um, I'm getting better at coming up with jokes like while I'm on the tram over here. So I think I've got two really good ones. Here we go. Well, terrible. By good, I mean terrible. So uh, how many machine learning researchers does it take to change a light bulb? Answer, I don't know, but uh, a Silicon Valley startup just raised $20 million to find out. So <laughs> how hard could it be? Mm. Mm. I've got, I got another more racy one, which I think is, I've always, I've always wanted to be good at one-liners, so here's sort of a one-liner. Did you hear about the machine learning researcher? She's in trouble with her uni boyfriend uh, because he called it cheating, she called it cross-validation. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's one for the ML nerds out there. Uh, yeah, so we have a huge show for you tonight and we've got a big announcement as well. So, um, well, let's get right into it. So, okay, um, AI grant, this thing just happened, um, but you should definitely get into the next round. There's a lot of like free money out on the internet for people with ML ideas. So, uh, AIgrant.org. Um, I applied with someone in the audience, Jarrell. So, we might... I might put up the video. Is it okay if I play the video later? Yeah, yeah? okay, it's not too embarrassing? All right. Otherwise, we can just talk about it in the, in the news. Um, secondly, uh, we are going to apply again for, uh, to create an AI accelerator, and this is part of the Launch Vic Round 4 funding. So uh, basically, we're trying to get free money from the government, which is always good. Uh, it's matched, so uh, the government gives you 500,000, and then you find um, investors to try and give you the rest. So for those of you who don't know, the concept of an accelerator is like basically what you need to make AI ideas happen. So we take teams, they say, hey, we want to be a part of it, we have an idea, and then you get mentorship and you get money to develop your idea. And finally, uh, about after, depending on how long the program is, probably about a year, then you can look for someone to try and invest in your company. So um, if you're into that sort of thing, if you're, uh, then this is happening. And importantly, I just sent out an email with a Google form. So when we uh, apply for these sorts of things, clearly we want to say like, hey, we're legit and there's lots of people waiting in the wings, like lots of Melbournians and Victorians who would want to be part of this thing. So if like, you have an AI ML idea, and you want to like make it a thing, then this is like, we've literally been rejected for this before. So we're going again, second time lucky, as they say, very, very commonly. Um, but you should definitely, definitely, if you have an idea, say, like do the form, like it's gonna take like two minutes and um, we'll put you in the application and say, look, here's all the people waiting in the wings who would want to do something like this if it existed. So hopefully it'll make our case stronger. So you can really help with that. And also if something like this existed in Melbourne, that would be awesome because it means that if you just have an idea, you can literally get paid to work on it, which is important because a lot of us so far have been working on things in our spare time. So this is kind of like as the meetup has grown, it's kind of, I guess, growing the ecosystem here. And that's what we've sort of always wanted to do. So um, yeah, I, I remember the, the speaker we have actually has talked once before at this meetup. And he, um, uh, we used to have it in a bar and it fit about 60 people. So yeah, this thing's really grown and we have recording now. So it feels, it's weirdly legit. <laughs> I'm still drinking though. Oh yeah, we have a videographer, that's Takeshi. He's awesome. If you uh, ever need any services, he's the guy I recommend. Okay, so uh, this is the segment, oh, actually before, I have got a special guest, Alexar, who's going to do a little 30 second about him to get your juices flowing. Do so you wanna come up here, Alexar? Yeah, yeah, now. I thought you wanted me to do this before. Yeah, yeah surprise. <laughs> okay, it's so. It's an introduction. Yeah. Basically, uh, I want to share my problem, so if anyone knows anything about it, please share, come and share it. Uh, talk to me. So we are working on a project, uh, open source project for public sector that's a content management si system but we want to uh, provide the recommendation functionality but we don't want to impl implement it ourselves. We want to use another service whether it's a third party whatever it is but we want to integrate with a recommendation engine but we don't want to uh, use APIs to uh, feed our content to that system. We want to use a a third party engine that doesn't require our content to provide us with a uh, recommendation for every piece of content that, that we request. I have been in talks where, I know that there are systems like that, but I'm not aware of any 
open source solution on any, any good uh, third party uh, service or application. So if you know of any, please uh, come talk to me. Thank you. Thanks, Alexar. Uh, yeah, so if you can help Alexar out, definitely go chat to him afterwards. All right, let's do the news. Yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, we are live streaming. If you're sitting kind of there, you, the back of your head will be in the live stream. So if you're shy about the back of your head, then move now, I guess. <laughs> All right, cool, good. Um, sorry, I should have done that earlier. My apologies. Um, all right, so here we go. Where's the news? Hey, can right, I so, go um, to news? Also, hey, all right. So, um, also, uh, if there's a thing you want to stand up and talk about, like a problem you're working on or a problem you want to know how to solve, definitely this is the time to do it. So, Andy, this is open to everyone. So what's, what's happening? Absolutely. So we've got. Absolutely. Uh, so we've got. Driving cars. Salmon. Driving mm -hmm. cars uh, with Andy G. And Kim and Lisa do here as well. Andy G. Uh, what's your second name, Cameron? Leeson. L-E-E-S-O-N. Awesome. Oh, yeah. So yeah, uh, Lee, uh, Cameron's there awesome. and Andy G's there. So if you are interested in building a scale self-driving car, eventually to obviously scale up to a full self-driving car, then um, I know you will be racing them as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then um, I think you'll be building and racing as well. Actually, topical, vote yes. If you have not got your thing before uh, September 25th, you can go to the ABS and get them to send it to you again. So I think there's a, uh, there's a, there's a vote yes thing here too. So there you go. We're, we're doing our bit. Um, finally, there was that, oh, that awful, awful thing. It was that, that gaydar thing, that deep learning gaydar. Stanford. I don't even want to put it on the news. I just want to call them out and say, I can imagine the dorm room conversation they had when they came up with that idea, and it was really stupid. They need to get out of their dorm every so often. Damn, Stanford grads. Going to be a butt of all jokes soon. Anyway, um, and yeah, so does, it, uh, does anyone have um, like an idea they're working on that they want to come up and talk about, or um, a question they have which they'd like to pose to the group? Okay, if you don't have one, but you should have one next time. It will be, uh, you'll be tested. All right, uh, any other news? Otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll finish it up. Awesome. All right, so uh, here we go. Oh, do, should we play this? Should we play our video, Jarrell? We'll play it. No, we, there won't be time to play it after. OK. <laughs> well, I'm just going to do this to embarrass Jarrell. It's only two minutes long. Yeah. I want to thank all of people in the world today don't have adequate access to medical care. 
big part of solving this problem is automating medical diagnosis. However, there are many challenges in applying machine learning to medicine, particularly in X-ray images. Firstly, medical data is usually unlabeled. And secondly, many machine learning algorithms do not give an explanation for their outputs. And without explanations, it's difficult to trust their outputs and potentially dangerous to act upon them. Our solution has two parts. One, learn high-quality representations by pre-training unsupervised or hundreds of thousands of scans which we now have access to. Part two, build in interpretability from the ground up. Our model architectures are fundamentally designed to allow interpretability. We believe that this will be the first pre-trained, unsupervised, large-scale CNN model. And once trained, we intend to release this model publicly. And this is how our model works. And our preliminary work. And this is how our model works. And our preliminary work done after our initial submission for the AI grant, we've trained a classifier of our model. An example here learns the difference between chest x-rays with and without heart failure. Using normal techniques we've invented, you can see how our network interprets these images. From the top left to the bottom right, you can see the initial x-ray image, the network's conception of that image, and what that x-ray would look like if the patient did at heart failure. The heat map indicates the difference between the two, and corresponds to our medical intuition that enlarged hearts are indicative of heart failure. We've worked together for a number of years and have published multiple papers in this area, recently placing highly in the Prospect X competition. We believe that receiving this grant will allow us to continue our work, and we're excited to see what other people can do with our models. Why are we doing this? Uh, trust me, I'm a doctor. Good big G for you. Guess me every time. Guess me every time. <laughs> oh, we get, I get caught. Wow, okay. It's you're too nice. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of seriously check it out. There's a lot of free money going around on the internet, so get on that. Um, the person that oh, hang on a minute. Ha um, <laughs> ha. Yes, one uh, T. <laughs> that was magic. I just <laughs> I have the implant. Um, <laughs> so uh, Matt Kelsey is an incredible researcher and awesome, friendly human being, and. Um, he spoken once before at the meetup, and it was awesome. And that's when it was in a bar, and it was it was dark, and um, and it was a, it was a great feeling. It did feel like we were sort of you know getting into something that was just starting out, especially in Melbourne. So um, I am super super excited and honoured to have Matt Kelsey back. And yeah. And now we do the awkward laptop change. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Can people hear me if I talk? Not really. I hate being mic'd up and stuff because I like to jump around. So. There we go. Well, you can just yeah. Okay. So hello everyone. My name's Matt. It's uh, really exciting to be here. Thank you so much for hosting me. Thank you, Amy, for your kind words. I don't think I'm incredible. I think I've just done some fun things. I think in the last year, and I'd love to share them with you. Uh, this is going to be a bit of a, I, I don't really think too much about my talks, I just like to like sequentially think about what's happened and like just brain dump, so this is a bit of a stream of consciousness for some stuff I've done recently. And so it's deep learning for robotics, uh, there's sort of three things I guess in this talk. There's robotics, and you know I had to put that there otherwise you wouldn't come because everyone loves robots. <laughs> there's uh, reinforcement learning which I think is, um, you know, out of all the machine learning tools we use is very, very applicable to the style of control that's required for robotics and lots of other things too, by the way. And then I put deep in here because deep neural networks are a really good function approximator for a whole bunch of stuff that we need, especially in uh, reinforcement learning. This is not a talk on NLP, which a lot of people will be surprised with because um, I've done a lot of NLP stuff. I'm sorry, we'll talk about NLP another day. What's funny is if this was a talk on NLP about deep reinforcement learning, 80% of it would be the same. And so this is an incredible part of neural networks, isn't it? It's, it's, it's all the same stuff. It's just rehashed. It's also not uh, about shaving robots. Alex can talk about this later, but it's, there's no shaving robots. I can. I, is this not working? Yeah, I can. I can hear some reverb in my brain. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Is that better? Is that? When you step to their camera. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to just be crazy. Oh, uh, there yeah. We go. Okay. So um, I'm going to I'm going to talk about things in the context of some problems I've worked on because that's that's how I frame everything in my head. And the first one I want to talk about is this uh, very simple project. This is my first sort of when I was playing around with reinforcement learning project. I call it DriveBot. And you, everything we're going to talk about, we can just download later and you can play with it. It's, this is a couple of years old, so maybe you've just got to bring it up to speed or whatever. But 
But um, I, this is the first sort of project I worked with where I was trying to play with um, some sort of, sort of you know, RL in the context of a, of a robot and maybe a car and stuff. So we're going to have this really simple problem where we're going to be driving this little bot around a, um, a track. And um, here's this little picture of the robot. It's very simple. This is this 2D world. It's very uh, sort of uh, idealistic. It's got this sonar. Everything's perfect. That's, you know, the software world. We'll come back to at the end of the talk about how we can transfer some of the things that we learn in these simple worlds into our real world, which is where all that really matters. So uh, I want to talk about the control of this robot and how it moves around the track using a couple of different terms. I'm going to bring them up one at a time. We're going to have this idea of an agent, which is the bit of software that we're writing for the control of things. And we're going to have some idea of, the, of everything else, which I'm going to call the world. And the world's sort of you know, how we get information about things. So that's sort of these two things I'm going to talk about. The world, and again, just for terminology, and the world is going to give us some state. That's sort of like our, you know, our view of the world. And you know, maybe it's a camera on a self-driving car. Maybe it's an accelerometer. There's some sort of you know, input. These are the things that we're going to make decisions about. And for this really simple first, first version of things, this state is going to be one of three values. It's going to be very simple, one of three values. Which of the sonars reports the furthest distance? Is it the, is it the one pointing to the front? Is it the one pointing to the left? or the one pointing to the right. And that's what these green arrows represent. They represent some sort of idea of a simplistic sonar. So this, this robot is in the state of uh, the furthest sonar being the front one. So this is like you know, one of three states. The robot, when it gets this state, is going to make a decision about what to do according to some uh, you know, plan or you know, some sort of objective. We'll talk about that later. And we're going to call that the action. And this robot, again, a very simple robot. It's got one of three actions. We're going to start really simple. Go forward or turn left or right. So this is, you know, the, the two views of the, of the world we're going to care about. What we're going to aim towards doing is learning a function that maps between these states and actions. That's what these controllers are. I'm going to call that a policy. If we had this policy, you can imagine that given these states, we're going to decide some actions to drive us around the track. That's where we're going. So all, hopefully this is all pretty straightforward. We'll just, we'll just build it up. Uh, all machine learning needs a baseline. There's a very, very strong baseline for this problem, which you may have seen. If the sonar that is the furthest away is the forward one, you should go forward. <laughs> if the sonar is the furthest to the left, you should turn left. And if the sonar is to the right, you should turn right. This baseline is uh, very good and will get us a long way. It has some nuances to do with the gaps in the sonar, particularly here. So you might be pointing this way and getting a signal that thinks you can go forward, but then you clip the wall. It doesn't matter too much. I'm just going to say that this is a good, this is a good baseline to work with. And uh, the main point I want to make is we want baselines. Baselines are good for machine learning, this talk or otherwise. So, so now let's, let's think about this in terms of a, a learning sort of thing. If we were thinking about supervised learning, hopefully everyone has an idea about this, uh, we're trying to learn this function between states and actions. The way that we would do this in a supervised learning context is to get pairs of these things that we deem good according to some criteria and try to learn this function. So um, if you, say for example, recorded yourself driving around the track, you would collect these combinations of states and actions that you are in your brain deciding that represents this policy. And you could learn this direct function. This is called um, behavior cloning. It's very commonly done. And it's, uh, it, it's very successful. It's good. But I want to talk about this problem in a slightly different way. I want to frame it in what's called reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, we're going to introduce another concept into this. We're going to have actions like we had before. We're going to get states, but we're also going to get a reward from the world. The reward is not the same as the state, and it's not the same as the action. It's just going to be a number. And what we're going to do is to try to maximize this reward. So the world's going to give us the state of things, but it's also going to basically give us a pat on the head. You're doing well or you're doing poorly. It's not the actions, and it's not the state. So our problem might be a little bit harder in terms of how the learning works, but our representation of what we want a good solution to be may be easier, because we're not talking about states and actions directly now. We're just talking about some function of the world that we maybe don't even see, which is good and bad. So for our problem, our, our simple problem again, the reward's going to be simple. If we said we were going to go forward, and we went forward, so we had some clear space, plus one, you get a point. If you said you wanted to go forward and you didn't, maybe that means you hit the wall, you don't get a score. And any time you're turning, you don't get a score. So again, this is, this is very simple. Hopefully this is a way of encouraging forward movement along the track. Now I haven't said anything about actions here in terms of like, you know, training. Um, well, I did, I guess I said in terms of go forward. But the main point I want to make here is this, these are not pairs of things directly. These are just sort of this um, scalar reward, which is neither an action or a uh, state. So what's going to happen then, you can imagine, is we're going to have this, it's a sequential problem, isn't it? We're going to get a state, we're going to choose an action and get a reward and go to another state, which, of which we will choose an action and get a reward and go to another state. So there's this big sequence of state, 
action reward state, action reward state, action reward, until some finishing criteria. We won't talk much about termination or whatever, but these sort of control problems are very much sequential. They're very much over time. They're not like the classification of an image where it's like, here's a picture of a dog or a picture of a cat. There's no, there's no sort of ordering in either of those. But this, these types of problems are very much sequential problems. So I'm going to decompose that sequence of state action, reward state action, into these little triples, or four, four tuples, I guess. So we're going to have a state that I was in, an action I took, the reward we got, and then the state we transitioned to. So these are going to be the unit we're going to talk about when we're learning. Where did we start? What did we do? What, did we get a reward or not? And where did we end up? And it's really important to think about here the fact that this, even though it's a, a sequence, state, action, reward, state, action, reward, this state is basically the, the first one and the next one because we're going to make another action. These are the units that we will, that we will learn on from that sequence. So here's, I want to go through an example really quickly. Again, I know this, I know this is a really simple example, but I just want to drill it in. Here's, here's, a, here's a collection of these events that might have happened in our simple world. We reported that the furthest sonar was to the left. We went forward and got no reward. So you remember that was because we hit a wall. And we're still the furthest to the left. So you know, our view of the world, you can you now sort of think, okay, it said left, I went forward, I hit the wall, and I'm still finding left, so you know, it's not good. So I'm in the furthest left still. I turn left. You always get zero when you turn, sorry, that's the rules. But now my furthest is forward. Okay, cool. I now go forward, furthest is forward again. I go forward and I get a plus, one. And, I, and my furthest is forward. One thing I want to make uh, clear here is that what's interesting in terms of a sequential problem is that I got no reward here. But turning left didn't give me any reward, that was part of the rules. But it was important to do so that I could then achieve this, this plus one. So one of the things that's interesting about these rewards as well is that they can be quite sparse. Even though uh, I wasn't giving information here, because basically you're not getting any feedback yet, I got this feedback here. It wasn't because I went forward, because that didn't work before. And it, it worked when I was furthest forward, but I had to get there by turning left when it was left. So one of the interesting things about these sequential problems is that the reinforcement learning, again, even though it was simpler for me to describe the problem, because I'm just talking about the sparse reward, it's up to the learning algorithm to decide how to attribute this back in time. And that's going to be an important part of what we're talking about. Okay, so algorithm number one, how are we going to solve this? We talked about these uh, representations, we talked about some sequences. I'm going to talk about uh, a very, I think, the, one of the fundamental ways of learning this. It, I think it's, very, pretty, it's pretty straightforward and lots of other things span off this. It's this idea of cue learning. Uh, it's from like the 50s or 40s, so we talk, certainly not you know, a new thing. This is an old idea. And the Q stands for the idea of quality. So again, we want to learn a policy state to action. That's our end goal because that's all we really care about at the end of the day. In a state, what do I want to do? But I want to introduce a second, slightly different function that we're going to actually use to learn. It's called the Q function, Q for quality. In a state, if I took an action, what was my expected sum of rewards going forward? So, you know, what, how well do I think this action will give me, not just immediately, but like into the future? And it's really important to talk about this being a sum because that's how we attribute this back in time, this idea of things later may occur. Even though it's going to be crappy now, maybe it's even minus one in the first step. And later I'll get a plus 10 or something. So we're going to use this function to learn on because it incorporates not just the state and the actions, but this reward, which is this weak supervision we're getting now, maybe quite sparsely over time. If we had that, that's good because the inference now becomes this idea of saying, what is my policy on the state? Well, it's the maximum action. You know, it's the best action I could take according to my Q function. So I'm in a state. I'm going to go through all my possible actions. Which one gave me the best Q? Because that's my best bet for the max reward over time. So this argmax will cause us some grief a little bit later, but this is, this is where we're at. Especially, you know, we're talking about discrete things at the moment, discrete states, discrete actions. It's okay for me to try this Q function three times and just pick the one that gave me the best Q. That's my best bet going forward. Okay, so how does this Q function, how do we learn it in relation to these learnable items I talked about, state, action, reward, state? Well, the Q function is this idea of expected sum of rewards. That's by definition, the sum of rewards going forward. What's good then is this Q function can be decomposed in terms of itself. Let's talk about this. The Q at state one, given action one, is going to be equal to the reward, because I know that, this is the reward I got, plus the best thing I can do from state two. That's, that's the nature of the Q function, it's the best thing possible. So I know, I know at least from my state and action I get reward, because I just, I just got it, this is, the, this is what I got told by the environment. 
And then from then on, the best I can possibly do is whatever my Q function is for state two. And so this uh, nature of this uh, Q function being defined in terms of itself allows me now to ground it in the reward that I know to be true. So what we're going to do is we're going to start this Q function and we're going to use this style of update rule to slowly move the Q function towards this optimal. And we'll talk about that. Okay, so a very, very side note on a thing called value iteration. Uh, this is probably something you've seen about. If I have um, some value, so this is, this is a bit abstract. It's very abstract. I'll represent abstract by literally waving my hands. <laughs> so if I have some prior value in something and I observe a new value, one way to update my uh, you know, belief about this thing is just to directly take, okay, I've, I've, I've observed a new value. I thought, it, I thought V was five, now it's six. Great, six, six it is. But if you don't trust your beliefs or you want to move things slowly, we can use this affine combo. It's a very common idea where we take whatever value we had before, maybe times 0.9, and then we say plus, you know, one minus 0.9 of this new value. It's basically, you think of an affine combo. I was at five, I was at six. You told me six, I don't fully trust you, so I'm just going to move one tenth of the way towards six. And if you keep telling me six, that's great, we'll get there eventually. But I'm just going to do things slowly. This is a classic, you, can, you know, it's very analogous with a lot of the way that we use learning rates. You know, I've got some belief and I want to get there, but I don't fully want to just jump in this huge big hit. I want to just slowly nudge myself towards something. So this idea of value iteration now can be used in, our, in the way that we do the Q function. So say Q gives us these random things at the start. And you know, literally, um, in fact, if I just jump forward, it, when things are discrete, when these states and actions are discrete, the Q value can actually literally be a table, a 2D table. It's, it's literally three by three, yeah? The, the, we have three states, three actions. So it's a two by two array. I just, I just randomly put stuff in, doesn't matter. Just random crap. And when I get a reward, like a, an actual reward, I'm gonna say whatever value is in there now, it's, I know it's random, but I'm just going to nudge it a little bit. This is what this affine combo is, and nudge it a little bit from wherever it is now to a value which is a grounded reward plus whatever the best I can do in state two. So your Q table, this, this is a Q table, it's actually literally a table, 2D table, will have garbage in it. But for every one of these that you know to be true, the world has told you, you're learning a little bit. You're using this reward to ground these values and just nudge them all into the right spot. Eventually, when the Q value is like perfect, you can imagine that these update rules don't do anything. Imagine that the Q value was, if the Q function, this, this table, was full of the exactly the right things, then this values would already be equal to each other. This value here, the Q for state one and action one, would actually be equal to the reward because this would be perfect. Does that, does that make sense? This is sort of a... Yeah. yeah. Do you keep like, uh, I guess, um, like the time, if you're running an experiment, like engineering background here, if you, a robot, you want to start it off slow, so yeah. the activities that happen at the start of its movement um, might be different to a minute in or something like that, or seconds in. Obviously, once something's learned a great deal about how to move, it could just go full bore at the start. Yeah. But is this, a, is this essentially um, timeless? Or it doesn't yeah. care about where it is? Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, there's, a, there's a couple of different ways I can answer that. That's right, you can just keep going. Yeah, so you're talking about the idea that, you know, if we have a large... So I'll rephrase this and tell me if I've rephrased it wrong. If I have a large number of these four tuples, some of them might be less informative than others because we sort of see the same ones again and again and again. Is that sort of what you're talking about? In, in a sense, and I guess like you're just saying that basically every time you see the information, whilst you do have like the previous step, I guess you can kind of put many previous steps into play to... Um, modify this, but in this case you're just talking about a singular. Ah, oh, yes, yes. Okay, so certainly this state, as we've described it now, is like this really simple one of three values. Just you wait. We're going to go through this from crazy states, like crazy stuff. So, yeah, I just wanted to really ground us in this idea of this thing, but yeah, we'll come back to some, some, some wild stuff later. Okay, so, but otherwise this sort of, you know, generally makes sense. We've got this update rule, this Q value, and we're going to learn it from these grounded rewards that are telling us about this sequence over time. Okay, so uh, I just want to talk a little bit again about this idea of the reward being sparse because that was really important. We saw in that, in, that, in that example I had of the three things, only the last one was a one and the others were zero. So if I think about a track like this and I think about my reward being if you go forward, you get a point and if you don't, uh, if you turn, you don't or whatever. That has some local optima which are painful. So here's an example. If you just go along for a while and then you do a 180 and then you go back and you do a 180, that's a reasonably good solution to this problem. So, you know... Optimizers are going to optimize. This is a, a classic thing, isn't it? They, they will find a good solution. And this is a reasonable solution for that, for that problem given that track. It's actually pre it's pretty good to just go back and forth like this. 
So, you know, this is a classic thing, you know, we have to do a bit of hacking in a sense of like, well, hang on, that's not exactly what, it, I know I told you to solve this, but actually I wanted you to solve something else. And so one of the good things about these rewards is that it allows us to, uh, you know, get around this pretty simply because all we can do is say maybe, let's just think about checkpoints. Let's think about these red lines that are checkpoints. And if you go over one of those checkpoints, I'll give you a point, and then you, you don't get another point until you go to the next checkpoint. Now, if we think back again to the supervised learning case of the states and actions, it's, it's the, this rule we've now talked about is reasonably complicated to maybe express all the time. But what I just described here is trivial in terms of how we would rewrite the reward function. So being decoupled from the idea of what this state and action pairing is going to be from your rewards is super powerful, super powerful. You're putting a lot more onus on the learning algorithm now, potentially to, to learn it, especially because you can imagine here there's a lot more zeros in that data. So a lot more sparse, which means a lot more data you need to gather. So these are the trade-offs we get, but it's you know, certainly going to be the case we'll see where there are cases where we're going to express the reward and then we would have no chance of expressing the relationship between the state and the action. An extreme version of this might just be, say, you only get a point when you do a lap. That's, that's pretty hardcore. And you can imagine that uh, the amount of data you would need to collect in terms of you know, banging into walls and whatever to eventually get this. The theory is sound, it would work, but the intensity of data you would require is huge. So these are the trade-offs we're talking with. There's also very fundamentally in, related to this is this idea called explore exploit. And we'll see, you know, this is a common thing in a lot of algorithms. I won't talk too much about it. But it's this idea that if we have these units that we're learning from, state action reward state, there's some idea that you know, over time we will you know, let the robot run and it'll do some stuff according to some you know, policy maybe while we're learning. And so there's, a, there's this fixed set of sort of um, state action rewards that we will, we will collect over time. So if we're only exploiting the function we know, this is the exploit mode, we're only saying let's just do whatever we're doing according to the queue function, we're likely to not explore the space fully. We're likely to get stuck in many ways because we don't sort of have a chance to explore. And by exploring, I mean literally just doing random stuff. Like uh, it's very common, uh, you know, the simplest form of this is called epsilon greedy, where you just literally say one out of ten times I just do random stuff. The idea being that even though it's inefficient, you know, you're doing something random, you might, you might hit the lottery and you might get us a little bit of info that shifts your queue function to now collect some more stuff. And this can be expressed in all sorts of interesting ways. Going back to this comment before about the idea of importance things, for example. If we were collecting a large number of these and we had some set that we had some confidence on, we weren't doing a lot of, when we did an update, we didn't get a lot from that update. We may choose not to look at those much as one that like when we did an update on, it was made a huge change to the queue function. There's lots of ways of sampling from our data and then actually saying, even though you know, I'm looking at this one more than I should, I can use a thing like important sampling to say, well, I'll make my update a little bit smaller though. So there's lots of techniques we have to sort of explore these things that we're grabbing. Okay, discrete states and actions, that's where we started. So, you know, only three things for each of them. And this Q function is uh, literally an array lookup, nine values, very simple. So that's cool, the theory is all here though. We're gonna back this theory now and we're gonna start to talk about some more complicated representations. What about continuous states? Let's start with those. These states were coming from sonars I talked about, three float values. And then what we were doing is picking the one that was reporting the furthest distance. So here's another representation, a little bit, we're gonna go back a little bit, a, less, a little bit less sort of, uh, you know, processed. And I'm gonna say my states here are some form of a distance. So the sonar left, the sonar right, and the sonar forward. And maybe you can do the same with the actions too, rather than just turn left and right, there might be some, you know, control on the motors. These can, we can choose now whatever we like with these. But the main point I wanna make is we're gonna call these continuous. These are now no longer discrete sets. We have now some idea of um, continuous stuff. So we're gonna talk about a Q function that's gonna take now continuous values. What are we going to do? Well, this is not a talk on neural networks, isn't it? Of course, we're gonna apply neural networks to this. So we're gonna re-go back through all the Q stuff we just talked about, but in the context now of not discrete states, but these float values. So, what, what, what's one uh, initial way of thinking about this? Well, let's just make some network, it doesn't matter what it is, that takes the states, we won't talk about continuous states for now, takes the states, so the three float values, and then takes this action, and just regresses to Q. That's, that's, a, that's a function we can use. Because um, it has some nuances, and you know, this is, a, this is more gonna be a bit of a talk on cool network, network, network hacking. We're not gonna actually use this, we're gonna use a slightly different one. And I'll talk about why. How did the update rule work? Well, we used the queue and the state and the action. That's what that network just gave us. We went directly to queue. But the second part of the update is that we actually need a max. So what would we do? If we had three actions, one way to get that max would be to run the network three times and then pick the one that was greatest and then use that going forward. That's, um, that would work, but let's talk about some cool ways we can optimize stuff. 
instead of calculating a Q value for one action, let's get this network to calculate the Q values for all three actions. This seems, in some ways, you may think, oh, this is really wasteful, why are you doing all this work? But let's, again, think about how neural networks work. There's this lower levels of representations they learn, which are functions of the states. And then in this case, we're regressing to this idea of a Q. So this is really only three heads on top of a, a, of a network. Even though we're doing this calculation of three Q values, it's certainly not three times the work of calculating one Q value. Because the idea would be that these states would have some common internal representation, which helps us then calculate the, um, the Q values. Why would we want to do that? Well, let's have a look at how we can use it in some cool ways. First of all, the, we need to be able to calculate the Q value for a state in action. That's how the inference works and how this left-hand side of the equation works. It's really easy though. All we need to do is basically mask out the Q we care about, the, which value, with just like a one hot vector, 0, 0, 1, for example, if we were interested in the third one, and then sum the values up. So, you know, I represent it this way. It's just like a dot product. It feels a bit weird, but these are, you know, certainly differentiable operations. So they will work well in whatever we hook up later. And um, they are very fast to do. So it's not a big deal. So again, we're just going to mask out the one we care about, a one, and the others one will be zero. And then just sum zero, zero plus whatever the one value was would be the Q value. That's for the left-hand side. The max is really easy. It's just the, the max of the three. So this is really nice. We've now got the ability to use this network in all the ways that um, the Q function is used here. For inference, it's just an argmax. We'll look at the three Qs. Which of the three Qs are actually the highest? We don't care about the value, so it's an argmax. We just care about which one was the highest. So now we've got this network, and we can use it in these two Qs. How do we do training? This, this is the killer slide, for, at least for, D, for DQN. This is an algorithm called DQN. This is the Atari learning paper you might have heard about, um, way back when, uh, MINS paper. So, What's this update rule? Again, we got, it's the same update rule. State one and action of the Q is equal to the reward plus the max. So what are we going to do? This left-hand side represents state one and action one. That's what we just talked about. I run the Q network, I sum, I mask out the one I care about and I sum it, that's that Q value. This right-hand side is the same network but with the max. So now we've got the Q of the left-hand side, the Q of the right-hand side, I'll add the reward and I'll look at the difference. What I'm going to actually do is use this difference as a loss. I just run squared loss against this difference. Called the temporal difference, because we're talking about the states over time. And I'll just use this literally as the loss for my, my optimizer. Why? Because we always want losses to go to zero. And if this loss was zero, what does it mean? If this was zero, it means that this left-hand side is exactly equal to the right-hand side. That's the perfect Q function. So we're going to use this idea of the temporal difference to train this network. And what's good about this is even though we had these actions here, which, you know, we had, might, maybe had like for the Atari, you've got like nine positions of the, the joystick and then nine for the button as well. You're calculating them all in one hit. You can run this for an update of the step in a batch mode in one go. There's one pass forward and one pass back. So I think this is a really elegant example of um, just some cool uh, architecture hacking. This, this insight they had about this idea of the Q values so that you could represent the whole side and then the idea of the temporal difference is a really old idea. So that's a, that's a cool, this is, this is the classic DQN. This is from uh, 2015. This is what got people very excited about uh, RL again for deep learning. Their states in their cases were the pixels on the screen, the actions were the controls of the, uh, the joystick, and the reward was the delta between uh, your last frame of the score. Now there's a whole bunch of try to train this. Uh, and the main contribution of that paper were how you uh, make this stable in training. And this is, the this is a talk for another day, uh, but there's two really interesting things to do with uh, an idea of a target network, and we'll actually address that a little bit, and then an idea of replay buffer, and it's to do with correlation of examples. Uh, you know, I don't want to talk too much about it now, but um, you know, the, the, the main crux of this is that even though this is good, like all neural networks, you need to know these crappy little tricks to make it work. So. Okay, so continuous states, we're good. What about continuous actions? Why can't we immediately use continuous actions in this, in this framework we've developed? Well, it's because we're calculating the Q value for all of them. We use a slightly different architecture and actually go back to what maybe we thought about as that first naive one. We're going to calculate two networks instead. This is an approach called DDPG, Deep Deterministic Policy Gradient, which is, uh, comes out of DeepMind and it was iClear 16. This was um, a way of now, this is the first sort of example of using this algorithms for action spaces being continuous as well as states. We're going to train two networks, not just one. The critic is going to be sort of similar to what we talked about before. It takes states and actions and it gives us a Q value. So that it, you can think it's exactly like a critic. 
I'm in a state and I did something dumb, zero. I'm in a state, I did something really good, 100. So this is, the, this is now responsible for telling us whether actions are good in a state. We also have an actor. An actor is directly what we talked about for the agent. This is the policy. What should I do in a state? So now we're going to separate these things a little bit. The reason for separating them, and we'll talk about how we train them in a minute, is that we're not now going to rely on this being discrete. This is now just a vector. You know, in our case, it might be a vector of two or it might be whatever. We'll talk about more complicated actions as we go. How do we train it? Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to train these in, in um, turn with each other. The way we train the critic is like what we did with the other one. We have an idea of a state from that, an action and we want the temporal difference in, in the future to be the same. This is the, the Bellman update we were just talking about. But for the Q value for state 2, we're going to actually use um, the actor in this step. So what, what are we doing here? Actor, we want the actor to represent the perfect policy. Yeah? We're going to assume that at least for now. So in state 2, what would the actor tell us to do? We'll use that to um, be our action for the critic to tell us in state 2 what the Q value is going to be. Everything else about this update is the same. So this is the same Billman update we were talking about before, the Q value with state 1 and action 1, and how it relates to being grounded to the reward we actually got, plus the best thing that we could possibly get going forward. Because this actor is meant to be the best thing. As we understand now, this section of, the of the, this network describes the Q value from state 2, because the actor will tell us the best thing it knows to do, and we will judge it. I've put, a, I've put a little box around here uh, to represent the fact that when we're training this, and I just wanted to introduce this a little bit, we actually normally don't uh, pass gradients back to this step. So we're going to run a forward pass and a backwards pass, but we're only going to update this side. We're just going to basically drop the gradients for that. And that's to do with stability of the fact that we're actually making an update to the same thing in one sort of hit, which is a bit weird, this idea of a target network, and also very related to the replay buffers. I just wanted to bring it up here, but it's one of the big stability problems with training these networks. So you're telling it to do one thing while you're telling it to do something else. So we basically lock this out with a, with a stop gradient, which is basically saying, use it going forward, but then for the reverse, just, just ignore it. I don't care, I'm just going to... So that's, that's a, a question about that. Are, we, are you loading anything into the actor about any kind of predisposition about what the problem is or anything like that? In this case, it's, it's all loading. Yeah, yeah. It'll, you know, at the start, it's going to be doing crazy stuff. And, um, you know, it's going to be all over the place. And eventually, it, through these guys being trained in step, we'll just talk about how we train the actor in a minute. Yeah. They will, in turn, improve each other. And my, my thought process in that was a slight thing about counter filters or other things like that. Yeah, yeah. Loading kind of like a phys physical knowledge about how Yeah, it's yeah. This is all what we call model free. We're saying the, everything about the world and the relationship between these things has to be expressed in these networks. This is a model free idea. There's no reason why, if you have a very good model that tells you things, that you can't incorporate it wherever you see fit in this. In this. This is like the lower bound for if you didn't know nothing. Okay, so that's the critic. What about the actor? So what do we want the actor to do? We want the actor to be the best, you know, sort of state it can be. Like, you know, what is the best thing to do? We're going to now use the critic and we're going to assume the critic is perfect. So given the actor, we're going to get a state. We're going to say, actor, give me the action that if you gave to the critic, gives me the maximum Q. So we're just going to do regression here. We're going to say literally, um, state to action, uh, what was your Q value? How should I change my actor to make this Q value go up? Because if the critic was perfect, it would, you know, basically tell you what to do. And in the same way, like before, we just don't, we don't apply gradients to the critic at this step. But, but, you know, neural networks, this is this amazing thing about neural networks. You just sort of bolt them together and you can work out, you know, gradients with respect to bits and pieces as you see fit. So I can just, you know, it's very easy to code this up. There's nothing inherent about either part that disallows this. But it's, it's, it's really easy to do. Actor, state to action. Okay, now if I gave that to the critic, what do they need to do? The critic tells me these gradients with respect to the Q. How should I make my parameters of the action change so that my action would have got a higher Q? So this is great. These two are training. However, you know, we're now talking about training two things and it's like even more unstable than it was before. But um, again, there's, there's approaches to, to uh, retain the stability. Okay. Stability hell. It's, it's all over the place. You know, you're training this thing, you're training this thing, this thing's training these two things. We have target networks and replay, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to talk about it. It's a pain. But, um, you know, they certainly... A lot of these papers introduce lots of tricks to make um, and heuristics to make these things faster. Heuristics everyone hates because it's like some hack, but you know we'll get there eventually. Yeah. Okay, so these were you know two very successful approaches, and we now have talked about this idea of continuous states and continuous actions, and this idea about how we learn this Q function to um, sort of learn this policy.
Okay, at this point it was algorithm frenzy. People were going crazy. There's DQN, there's TRPO, there's double DQN, there's this continuous on DDPG, then how do you run, if you run them asynchronously, A3C, what about if you do this other thing, NAF, QPROP, blah, 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 it just goes on and on and on. So this is a very active area of research. Lots of people have lots of ideas that are primarily around stability and data efficiency. Because a lot of these techniques, to make stable, you need to run maybe, you know, uh, lots and lots and lots of data. And the most recent one was the, you know, the distributed DDPG, PO, uh, the parkour paper from DeepMind, you know, this is an awesome paper. A couple of these talk about a bit more about a thing called policy uh, optimization, policy, you know, sort of uh, approaches. We've been talking so far about the idea of trying to calculate a value queue functions. So there's two sort of branches here that are related, but we've been talking mainly about queue functions. I think they're a little bit more um, uh, easier to ground in our head. Yeah, and special mention that um, I see it all this year that one of the DeepMind people was working on um, uh, trying to of fit the entire distribution of Q values. Yeah. So it's like, oh, not only give me the expected, give me the entire yeah. distribution of rewards. Yeah. And that parkour paper is awesome. If you haven't seen it, it's the punching <laughs> yeah. the one where he's yeah. jumping over all the hoops and stuff. Yeah, it's awesome. Okay, so. I, I want to see Terminator do that. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and the Boston Dynamics. So. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, so we now had some framework for um, Q values. We talked, you know, it was a bit airy fairy, but anyway, hopefully a little bit made sense and you know, it sort of grounds. We talked about some continuous states and continuous actions. And we also talked about a baseline at the start that was much, that was pretty good. So, you know, I, I would find it hard to argue, let's make this actor critic DDPG network when the baseline probably did extremely well. But the good thing about this is it starts to allow us to do much more complicated things. So let's talk about some more complicated things. Three sonars at 90 degrees, if then else statement. It's OK, fine. But this algorithm just naturally automatically works if you assign five random sonars. So here's, here's a robot I made with five random sonars. Rather than three values, I'm going to have five. And it's just going to, it just works. There's no, nothing to do. So if I train this, you know, ran it over time, this robot would get better and better and better. And would learn to maybe ignore one of these because it's not related to the other. Maybe it would learn to ignore this. Or I don't know. It would, but it starts, to, it starts to work. That's five random sonars instead of three sonars. Why not have random sonars per robot? No problem at all, just stick some stuff more into the state. The, we can have now the state being the five sonar readings as well as the five angles that the sonars are at. So that we can now represent this robot being different to this robot being this different to this robot. Maybe per state even, not even per robot. So every time step now because you can think, you know, you can think in your head now what the neural network has to do. It has to now relate these angles to the, to the, um, to the sonar values to try to build one common representation which is then used for the actions. So the good thing about this is that even though that if then else statement was clear for the three, I'm not sure what my if then else statement would be for this. It's starting to get more and more complicated. So this, this is now starting to grow into more and more general states and actions because these neural networks are very, very, very good at building representations for that type of learning. Okay, project number two. So that was DriveBot. Let's talk about a different project. This is a classic control problem called the cart pole, inverted pendulum. Lots of people would have seen this. It's a really um, simple problem. I'll go through it really quickly in case you haven't. You have a cart on the ground, which you can move left and right. And on top of it, you have a pole and it, with a weight on the end of it. The idea is that you start in this position, you get a random tap, and you have to move the cart to rebalance the pole. It's a, it's, this is probably from like 400 BC or something. This is an old problem, yeah? <laughs> so it's, um, but it's fun in the dynamic sense that it's actually non-trivial to solve. If you're looking at, looking at this and think, ah, oh, that's an if then else statement again, it's actually not. And I encourage you to play with it because it's actually a pain. But it's a fun dynamics problem. And in this case, the, the two-dimensional version of this, we have what's common is a four-state representation. The x, which is the position of the cart, uh, x, prime, x dot, which is like a velocity. We've got a first or a second order thing. Uh, theta, which is an angle, and then an angular velocity, theta, theta dot. So, you know, you want to know how fast it's falling, not just where it is. The action is just a force. Do we push left or do we push right? And again, the reward in this case is nice. It's just plus one until your angle gets past a certain point, and then it's, you, you're dead. So it's a, it's a pretty easy state, these four values, it's a pretty easy action, just you know, plus minus one maybe, whatever it might be, and um, then a reward. So this is a classic thing. I wanted to make something a little bit harder. I made a thing called cart pole plus plus. So this is a cart pole in a, in a three-dimensional sim simulator called uh, Bullet that we used a lot of at work. And um, the interesting thing about this is it's in 3D, that's one thing. But more interestingly, you know, I made sure that the pole was not connected to the cart. So the dynamics of this problem is a little bit fiddlier. If you watch the start of this video, just about there, you can see the pole pivoting, not just from one center point, but actually rotating around. And then as it learns, so that blue line is just an arbitrary line, it's just, just a ray. But you can see that. So what's happening in this video is the cart at the start gets a bang, 
the controller is pushing the cart back to recover and then doing some small incremental adjustments. So, and you can see the main point I wanted to do here is that the pole's really light, it's featherweight. So when you make these, pole, these cart movements, the pole's actually sort of, you know, rotating around and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. So, um, talk about the state in a second, but the actions are just the, F, the Fx and Fy, so it's just the force. The reward's exactly the same as before, plus one until it gets past a certain angle from, from the Z, and then it's game over. So let's build up some fun states. First of all, we're going to talk about the pole. And again, it just let's, let's think about what's the simplest way for us to describe the problem, not the algorithm. I'm going to use a pretty simple seven-dimensional uh, sort of representation of this. There's three for the X, Y, Z, and in this test, uh, it's a 4D quaternion. So I'm not going to talk about quaternions because uh, they're crazy, but it's just a four-dimensional representation of, of an angle of rotation. So this is just a convenient way. In fact, the, one of the main reasons to get this is from the simulator from Bullet. When I say, give me the... Uh, position and orientation, this is what it gives me. So that's great, I just I literally will grab it. It's a, it's a convenient, I want to make sure I express it. It's a convenient way for me to express it, not the network. You know, maybe orientation's a terrible thing. But anyway, so we've got the, we've got the pole, that's our start. That's seven, seven values. We've also got the cart, because we're connected to the cart, remember? So I need to know this, X, I'm gonna use the exact same values for the, for the cart as well, X, Y, Z, and the orientation the, in 3D space. And so I've got, um, uh, a two by seven. Now I've got a, a matrix, a 2D matrix, that I can flatten to 14 if I want. But you know, this it's, it's two by seven. The first row is the cart, and the, or the pole, or whatever, and the second row is the um, cart. So it's two by seven now. We need to know velocity because this problem is not just about time step; it's about how far it's falling. So rather than talk about things in terms of velocity, I'm just going to give you two pairs of positions. And if you need velocity and you think it's interesting to solve the problem, then that's great, you'll solve the problem using it. So now we're talking about 28 values, two by two by seven. The first axis is time, so over two time steps. The second axis is the cart versus the pole. And the third axis is the, the pose, of which the first three are uh, uh, Cartesian and the last four are orientation. Again, I'm just, whatever I think is useful for me to, to give you that I think you need and you just work it out. So it's, we're talking about 28 values now. And again, let's go even crazier. Why not images? Forget about poses. Let's talk about you know, these networks being good for control. And in fact, that last picture we saw was something that didn't, wasn't being controlled from that, uh, from that 28 dimensional vector. It's being controlled from an image that looks like this. So this is a deep, it's actually, forget about this debugging info. This is just the, um, the only GIF I had because my computer is literally was just come off a boat from the, from the other country. So this is the only thing I have on my laptop. But um, so we have this idea of a, uh, an image, literally just rendered from the thing. Uh, forget the pose, you now need to, as a computer, solve this in terms of an image. That's fantastic, convolutional neural networks, I'll just bolt literally on the bottom of what we've talked about so far. So an image is, in this case, it's 50 by 50 by three. That's just what we have. So height by width by channels, in this case, um, Things are clearly red and green, which is nice for the learning at least. And like we talked about before, we need it over two time steps though at least. So this, this, this data is actually two by 50 by 50 by three. And just for the convenience of how we use um, ConvNets, uh, I'm just gonna basically concatenate that two timestamps into uh, six channels. So you can imagine now that um, instead of having three channels, red, green, and blue, this thing's gonna get six channels, red, green, and blue at time step one, red, green, and blue at time step two. So it's 50 by 50 by six, instead of 50 by 50 by three. I, for convenience, for me, because it means that I can just use off the shelf uh, 2D ConvNets. It also reflects the fact in this case that I think about there's some interesting correlation between a single pixel over two time steps. Because what I'm doing is I'm actually putting them in the same, in the same spatial coordinate. And I think that's reasonable and sort of does make sense. And, and you know, to be honest, even if it didn't, it would learn and do the right thing. So. so you know, and you know, you know, just because I wanted to talk about it here, this is the fun thing to do is once you start to, uh, you know, represent something, you can start to do whatever you think is interesting. So maybe instead of channel concatenating immediately and making it six, I might choose to run this through one conv uh, layer and, you know, build up maybe 25 by 25 by eight. So I'll do one sort of pass over this in terms of a conv pass and then uh, do the same for the second image and then channel concatenate and tie these weights. And maybe there's some argument that my initial processing of the first frame should be exactly the same as my initial processing of the second frame. It's okay to share those weights. This is the sort of thing that you maybe want to do later if you're thinking about how do you start to save parameters. 
because this has less parameters than the previous one. It doesn't matter too much, don't need to think too much about that, but you know, either will work, and especially in this very simple problem. Okay, there is a small problem case though, and what's interesting about these things, and it actually comes from this exact example we've got here. So this control was pretty good, but if you see how it runs now, you'll see when it starts, it sort of, it manages to balance it, and there we go, I'm balanced, and then it's like, whoa, what happened? It fell over, what, what was it doing wrong? What's interesting about this is that the way I was rendering this image, as you might not have noticed, but I, was cr I was, had the zoom in enough that I was cropping the top of the pole. You never see the top of the pole here, I, I hadn't even noticed myself. What it's doing is that I was noticing that one out of like um, you know, about 20 would drastically fail during testing. And the reason for it is it's balancing the pole, but then the pole is falling in line with the camera. And the resolution is such that you don't notice it. So if you look at it, try to see it, but you just can't see it. So it balances it, and then it's falling. I can't remember which way it's falling. It's falling forward or back. It falls past the position where its, it's velocity is now, it can't retain it, and it does this uh, crazy move to try to recover. Well, what's the simplest thing we can do? What about we just point two cameras at right angles? So instead of now having one camera, let's just stick another one in and render it twice. So now we've got two cameras by two time steps, by 50, by 50, by three. And again, what's the simplest way to put this into a comnet? Just concatenate those channels. So now we've got red, green, blue, one camera, one time step, red, green, blue, second camera, second time step, blah, 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 blah. And we get 12 channels instead. And again, this just works, it's, it's great. And in fact, when you've got batching, because you want to always batch things, we end up with 64 by two by two by 50 by 50 by three. And if you're like me and you judge yourself by the size of your input tensor, it's like, yes, <laughs> 60 tensor, that's, that's pretty good. Before the concatenation of this. So you can also, uh, rather than having two cameras, uh, this is an experiment I did where one would have one camera and allow it to move around. So now our state's gonna be two time steps uh, by 50 by 50 by three, plus the current angle of the camera. And the action is going to be the cart movement plus a rotation of the camera. And uh, what this learns to do basically is learn to keep the camera at right angles to the pole. So as the pole falls down, it will move the camera around to give it more information about the fall and it will balance. So this is again a great example of the reward is not changing here. All I'm doing is changing the states and actions and the controller is able to, um, to pick these things up. These are pretty, you know, complicated. They're starting to get more and more complicated in terms of the control. Okay, everything we've done so far, no robots. Let's, let's look at some robots. And the, for the robot part, it's gonna be interesting because we're gonna just basically rehash all the things that we've just now talked about. Continuous states, continuous actions, and um, how we would apply them to some specific robot problems. So this is the KUKA Iowa. It's a, it's a fantastic industrial robot. Um, you know, it's about yay big. It's, it's quite expensive. I think they're like 100K or something. But the accuracy and precision of these robots is astounding. Like they are able to move in these incredible ways. And you know, one of the reasons why they're um, really, really expensive is because the sensing and actuation of these robots is, is, is spot on. It's, it's awesome. And so a lot of the times, yeah, I think about these robots as being incredibly expensive because of the hardware. But the software control of these things is, um, you know, it, it's, it's not too complicated. So we've got a lot of motivation to try to say if we had cheaper motors and cheaper sensing, could we move a lot of the control problems into software? Because if I want to make one of these robots to put in everyone's house, I need the robot hardware to be uh, cheap, even though the complicated software uh, maybe comes along for free, basically. You just, you just copy the software, yeah. So the setup I'm going to talk about is the one that we've been primarily using, uh, that we used at Google, which is this idea of grasping. Grasping is like the classic first problem you need to solve if you're going to be doing manipulation. If, you're going to, if you want to screw something up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so if you're going to be doing something and you want to be doing manipulation, what's the first thing a robot needs to do? It needs to pick something up. So this is the classic setup we uh, use for, uh, for grasping. And so the idea is we have a bin with objects in it, and this robot's sort of going in and out of the bin, picking stuff up. Now, in this case, we've got lots of options of how we represent state and actions and then rewards. So let's go through them really quickly. Oh, before that, though, one really important thing, that, and this is one of the main things I was working on, is this idea of, like, the robots are great. They're fantastic. There they go, doing this awesome stuff. Uh, if, if we've got six robots here in one of the labs and they're $100,000 each and they're running in real time, and, you know, you can see how long it's taking to collect. This is at four times the speed because of the safety thing. Uh, it's going to be pretty expensive to gather a lot of data. And so um, this is great because this is the real world and that's actually what we care about. But what is super important is how do we solve these problems in a simulator and transfer it to the real world because that's the only way we're going to make this thing scale. So this is an environment that um, it's a little bit different to what we use, but it's exactly, you can download this right now. Uh, it's by this guy Erwin who uh, wrote all our tools and Erwin's like awesome in terms of this physics simulator. He has an Oscar for doing this work from because of 
His uh, toolkit is in like every PlayStation and every movie you've seen probably. And he's built this thing which is basically uh, a simulated version of what we just talked about. We've got a tray, we've got the robot, we've got a gripper, and um, we've got some objects we're going to play with. So I highly encourage you to have a look at this framework. It's, pre it's pretty awesome. So let's think about what our states were going to be. So you know everything we talked about before um, is, is very equivalent in terms of it being continuous. We might have uh, this robot is a seven DOF ro robot, so it has uh, seven degrees of freedom in the arm. And it also has a, this end effector in this case is a gripper. So the state of our, ob of our robot can be as simple as the positions or the velocities or the torques of the, of the, of the arm. And then whatever we want to do with the um, uh, end effector, maybe open and close or whatever it be. And, uh, you know, it's also very interesting for us to think about the state in terms of images. So if you see in that uh, middle image, we've got some cameras sitting up here that are looking into the tray. And so we've done a, a lot of this work includes, uh, you know, we've got to make sure that this robot is able to do things based on an image. Because even though we might have a lot of information about the, uh, the arm, we don't have ground truth information about things in the tray, for example. And so being able to relate the arm and the objects in the tray is good, not just for the fact that we're picking up the objects, but also because potentially the robot can start to infer information about its arm from picture rather than from super, super expensive uh, sensors. And so, Every, all the learning we just talked about is exactly the same though because we talked about how we stick some arbitrary numbers in and we talked about how we would stick some arbitrary images in. So that's our states. The actions are sort of equivalent. We've got some joint controls for the robot and we've got you know, um, sort of control for the gripper. You know, there's different levels as well uh, of how we want to talk about things. We might want to talk about things in terms of the raw angles of joints or we might only actually care about the position of the gripper. And so there's a lot of things that are available to us in terms of like inverse kinematics to say, actually, I just want the gripper to be in a certain point and you work out where the, um, where the joint angles will be. But the point of this is that the neural network can decide to work in, you know, you might want to work in velocities or you might want to work in torques or you might want to work in um, uh, this pose of the end effector. The learning algorithm is the same. What suits your problem, it, it's fine, it'll just work. Well, it doesn't always just work, but it should just work. <laughs> Uh, rewards, again, this is interesting because we had these three things, didn't we? States and actions and rewards. For the simulator, it's great. Everything actually that we're sort of talking about so far it was simulated in a way, wasn't it? We'll come back a little bit. In terms of that first one, we'll talk a little bit how it transferred to the robot but f to a real uh, driving machine. But for now, let's talk about it in the context of this robot. So we have ground truth in the simulator. That's great. Ground truth not just for the arm but also for, um, for the objects. But it's a, it's a pain in the real world. There's like endless... We might have lots of information about the robot arm, but we don't have much information about the objects in the tray. And so one of the good things about weak supervision as well, this idea of reward, using rewards, is it doesn't have to necessarily be perfect. So there's all sorts of simple heuristics you can stick in here. So one of the things that we did for grasping, for example, is we would take a picture of the tray with the arm away from things and look at it. We would then go and do some stuff in the tray and then pull the arm up. If the arm thought it had something in its gripper, and the image now looks different, success. So this, you know, this is a very high level, you know, sort of, you know, there's a lot of cases where that will get wrong. But the whole point of this as well is, is it's easy for us to describe the problem in this weakly supervised way. You know, I'm just literally saying image difference, zero or one. I'm not talking about positions of objects or like the arm or anything. It's, it's a very, very um, abstract reward from states and actions. But yeah, the real world is a pain. It's slow, things break, they fall over. What a pain. So. Uh, another thing that's super important, and this is a, a little bit of just of one, of one of those things, that, and, I, and I hate this actually, this idea of reward shaping, but anyway, so one of the things that we might talk about is if um, we're interested in training to pick something up. So how do we, how do we represent that picking up? Maybe we're going to say um, how high off the table it is. That's going to be my reward. But you can imagine here that if you had a, a learning system that's trying to learn this, at the start the robot's doing all sorts of crazy stuff, and it has to be by accident it somehow manages to, to move or to pick something up. And that seems like a very unlikely event. So what's really common, you see a lot, is this idea of what they call shaped rewarding. And in this case, the shape reward might be the distance off the table of the object we're trying to pick up, plus some smaller magnitude value uh, times the distance from the gripper to the object. So even though we don't care about the necessarily being close, we use that second term to sort of encourage you to move near and then when you start to accidentally pick up, this, the first term uh, takes over. 
I, I really, there's something that in, irks me about this sort of idea of like this, you know, where this combo. Yeah. Why? Why not using the inverse reinforcement learning problem? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Instead of feature extraction, different kind of uh, yeah. rewards yeah. Uh, function for that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, inverse RL is certainly. No, no, no. It's certainly very, very applicable to these types of problems. But um, a lot of the time, people do this. As, um, and you know, this is a bit of a general statement about shaping, but. Yeah, inverse RL is certainly another way and probably more accurate for, for the grasping problem, but yeah. Too many RL things to talk about. Yeah, but that's a good point. It's, it's full employment, and you want to um, make sure that there's always something to engineer. Make engineering yeah. work functions. Yeah, I just, I just hate it. Yeah, it's exactly right. It used to be like you'd always you know, engineer features, and then it was architectures, and now it's reward functions, and it's just like, yeah, we're always in a job, yeah? Well, learning policy at sub yeah. you know, the kind of learning to learn, and then yeah. by then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just, it just, we'll, we'll always find something to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, I think I'm getting close to time, so let's go through this last bit quick. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, some transfer stuff. Actually, this is the main thing I worked on, the idea of transferring between the simulator and the real world. Because, you know, we can go, it's easy for us to gather hundreds of millions of examples in the simulator, uh, but if they're completely different to the real world, then they are useless when we try to learn a policy that's for the real world. So we need to be able to relate these two things together. So I built this little robot. This is the equivalent, the, the equivalent of that simulated one. So it's got the same sort of thing, wheels, and it's got sonars. Um, unsurprisingly, the sonars behave extremely differently to the to the simulated one, but that's okay. That's the point of these sort of experiments to um, talk about how far you can have them being different. So I'm going to talk about two approaches to things. Uh, they're both in the adversarial learning context, and I think the adversarial learning is actually probably the most interesting idea in neural network training, I think, in the last five years. I think it's, I think it's a really fascinating idea. And I'm going to talk about two uh, sort of slices and versions of it. Uh, the first one is, uh, is, uh, is pretty awesome. This is the first one I played with. It's called Domain Adversarial Learning. So I'm going to, again, let's be a bit abstract here. So I have some idea of some states, and I'm trying to learn uh, a mapping to some actions. And what do neural networks do? They learn these intermediate representations of things. This is very vague, again. This is squares and triangles and stuff. But you know, this is a common idea in these networks. Take some input and then some changes to them, often you know, with non-linearities, otherwise what's the point, to, to regress or you know, to some to set of uh, actions in this case. What I'm going to do in this case is I'm actually going to stick another little network onto the side. So I've got two networks here that are sharing some parts of themselves. The one on the left-hand side is the main one that's mapping from states to actions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed this network examples that are states from the simulator. And I'm going to also feed it examples that are states from the real world. They're both going to go up from the bottom. That, so that S bit is either real or, or simulated. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a second network off to the side. And its job is try to classify that state and to say whether it's real or fake. So it's nothing to do with the actions. This, this one off to the side, its only job is to try to work out if that state is real or fake. So let's think if we were training these two things together. The left-hand side, from states to actions, what is it trying to do? It's trying to make these representations here useful for the goal of mapping from states to actions. That's what this left-hand side does. What is the right-hand side doing? It's trying to say, what are the useful features that I can use to distinguish whether the state is real or simulated? So in many ways, these two networks are in competition at this point. They're adversarial to each other. This network wants to change these features for its purpose, S to A. This network here wants to change these features so that it can tell the difference between states that are real or simulated. So this is an easy label for us to get because we know whether they're simulated or real. So it's really easy to have these examples and we've got these examples already. Now the trick is, it's a really cool idea, it's a really small font so I'll read it out, it's to reverse the gradients. So what, what does this do? In terms of how back we go forward, and then we have some idea of gradients that tell us how should you change yourself so that I do better at my job. This network's job was to tell the difference between real and simulated. If we take the gradients, it's telling us here, and do the opposite, we actually change it. This network says, hey, it's harder for me now to tell the difference. I wanted it to be easier. You're making it harder for me. What are we doing when we're making this network's job harder? We're removing any information it knew from this part of the representation that helped it tell whether it was real or simulated. That removes the same parts of the representation for this network to be able to now operate on things that were explicit to the real or simulated. 
because ne networks are incredibly exploitive. They will find whatever they need to find to do their job, regardless of whether it was something that was only in the real world simulator. They don't care. So by doing this, we need to give this network more capacity. But what we've done is a form of domain regularization. We've now said that these representations here are now squeezed out in terms of whether they were simulated or real. This is, these guys are adversarial to each other and it's called domain adversarial because we're now saying that this guy can't do its job and this is domain regularized. I think it's a really cool idea. And uh, again, because networks are playing against each other, there are, there are pain points. But um, it's a really, again, cool idea about the fact that these networks are extremely decomposable. Three networks are at play here. I'm actually going to do this trick where we reverse gradients. This is a, this is a very simple, um, you know, it's a very simple idea at its core, but it's very, very powerful. So that's one thing, and that, that just works for this problem we talked about with the um, simulated robot. It learns to standardize across these things for whether they're real um, or simulated in terms of huge union. So it's a bit of, it's a, bit of a, it's a, it was an easy thing to do anyway, but it was a proof of concept, and it certainly has worked for other um, examples of robotic control with simulated real images that um, are in papers that have not been released yet. Maybe if I do this talk in a month, we can talk about different stuff. Anyway, so the other one um, that I think is interesting is... Um, uh, to do with uh, the same idea of adversarial learning, but in a generative, generative context. So this is a really cool architecture. It's called um, pix to pix You might, may have seen this. It's a really cool idea. And I don't know what everyone has done in, with, in terms of GANs, but I'll just give a very high level of view of things. What we're going to do is we're going to try to learn, um, and I, I wasn't allowed to show the robot pictures, but this is the same sort of thing, but with, say, simulated maps and uh, real maps. This is a translation between um, a satellite image and a, um, a map that looks like Google Maps. What we're going to try to do is we're going to, rather than make a network which is able to be fed simulated or real images, we're going to make another network that translates between simulated to real images and then use those real images. So we'll train everything based on the network thinking it's got real images, but we'll just use this other network first to, to, to translate simulated one to real one. So this is, I'm going to call this the simulated one, and it's going to try to translate to this real one. So all we really care about at the end of the day is this network, the G the generator. Simulated to real, that's our end goal. How do we train this thing? What we're going to do, and this is the classic pix to pix model, you might have seen the example of one where you draw the one with the, and it makes the, you draw the line drawing and it makes this ridiculous version of like a weird cat or something. You know, human, I don't know if you've seen this, it's really disturbing. It's awesome. This is the same, this is the same paper, same model. Uh, so what we're going to do is we want this thing that translates from one domain to another. How do we train this thing? So uh, you've probably talked about GANs before, but I'll just give a quick summary. What we're going to do is we're going to have another network called the discriminator, and it's going to take pairs of images, not just one image, but a pair of images. It's going to take uh, either real pairs, so these are from a ground truth set, and what it tries to do uh, is, well, these general task is to try to say, is this a real pair of images? Is this really the real version of this fake image in terms of this um, pair of images? So we feed it, sometimes we feed it real images, that's like one form of it, but another time we also feed it this one, but the image that came out of G. So again, these, this D is a discriminator, it's trying to tell which are the fake ones and which are the real ones, which have come from G. And again, so there's this adversarial play between the two. At the start, if G is doing crazy stuff and just generating like, you know, bright red images, at the start, if this is mapping to bright red images and you showed it a bright red image versus this, D's like, oh, that's clearly a fake, you know, you're terrible. But we use the gradients from that decision to make uh, this decision a little bit harder and G gets a little bit better. So we've got this idea of a counterfeiter and um, another one that's trying to tell. And so at the end of the day, these play against each other. The D gets better and better at telling the difference, but G gets better and better at making fakes. So at the end of the day, all we really cared about is this, uh, this G and that's all we use at the end. And so it's able to simulate, it's able to translate between the simulated versions of images and the real images. And in fact, if I go back to here, um, I, can't, I can't show you exact pictures, but I can show you one thing. If you look at one thing it does, which is really cool, I don't have a, a view of the simulator here, but you can see in this simulated image, the arm is very simple. It's flat shaded, it looks pretty fake. Um, the real one has a logo on the side here, KUKA, that's the logo. It has things like these um, cables and stuff. These would all be things that if I took the rendering out of that, because you can just do a rendering, you know, do, you, do you or do you not have cables? That tells you whether you're a fake. Do you or do you not have KUKA on the side? That tells if you're a fake. This G actually learns to draw these things in. It learns to put cables in that are realistic. It learns to write KUKA on the side. It learns to cast a shadow from the arm down into the tray because these are the things that D could use to tell the difference. 
So it's really powerful because now we've actually ended up with this as a network that can basically translate the rendering that comes out of this very simple simulator and make it look realistic. And the rendering from the simulator can be very simple. It can even be a segmentation mask. Like literally, like a big green blob for the arm, a big red blob for the tray, and it'll learn to draw textures and whatever it needs to do to fool that arm discriminator. So it's super powerful because now it's a way of taking the simulated data of which we have huge amounts and turning it into the equivalent domain of the real data. And that's it. Thank you so much. I don't know. Was that on time? I don't know. Yeah, that's pretty on time. Yeah. Should we do it? We'll do five. Yeah, I had a tick in my head. That's, you did well. Yeah. So we'll do uh, maybe like five minutes of questions for Matt. Like, yeah, maybe maybe we'll do two or three. Anybody from the um, audience? I'll kind of hand yeah. up here, but I'll ask if, you, if anybody else wants to. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, if, like, uh, so uh, I read an article talking about how the kind of wanted position for teaching, say, a robot to do a task is rather than kind of holding its hand or manipulating it and grasping and placing a mug on the shelf and it's help, whatever, is you kind of get the mug and you say, watch me, and then you yeah, put it on the yeah. shelf and try it a few times. And it's a bit like Iron Groot in, in the <laughs> second yeah. generation where he's trying to deactivate the bottle or whatever. Um, if people have seen the Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Um, he gets it wrong every time. Um, but it's basically, I'm um, curious as kind of the role in which adversarial um, approaches like you just talked about might play in that and how quickly they can um, use, say, some basic instruction, run that then through a whole lot of um, iterations using that as an input and then actually then play that out in their own adversarial approach, yeah. just like showing a bad image yeah. um, and then going from that. Has any research been done to, to provide some base level uh, interaction yeah. and then run that heavily through adversarial and bring in like past experience of how the manipulator moves and other things like that yeah. and how grasping works and all the rest of it? Like all those things together? Yeah, I can't, I can't think of any directly relating to oh, that. Oh, sorry. Could you just repeat so the idea that? is like, um, you know, what, what everything I just talked about is model free so far, it's actually to learn from its own examples completely randomly. And what you're talking about is the idea of imitation learning, yes. where we have, you know, humans are able to do this already, so yeah. why not use them to, to yeah. seed? Uh, yeah. Sets. You might have like a model where a, 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 a robot knows how to grab a mug, yeah. it just doesn't know where to put the mug and how to put it up there. Um, and you actually then say, okay, it's not a mug now, it's a, it's a, it's a teacup. This is how you hold a teacup, and this is how you have to go on the saucer, for instance. Yeah, but you yeah so it's worth checking out. Um, at ICML, I think um, Sergey Levine and also his PhD student Chelsea Finn are working on kind of adversarial models, but for demonstration learning, like learning from human demonstration. So it's definitely worth checking that out. Okay, because yeah. it strikes me as one of these things where you just have to know what the teacup's delicate, so there's a certain way you move yeah. it, and all the other things, but you can basically borrow from the whole. In my library, in you know, incorporating physics are definitely important as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of people think about these things from, like, especially from the model free thing, because it's like a lower bound. It's like this is the best we can do. But everything you just talked about are very, very practical things to actually solve this much quicker than it would be if you just completely experimented. But yeah, I think a lot of these things are very composable. So if you have some rough idea about how that can be mixed and matched, there's yeah. the toolbox is available. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, um, yeah, one more in the back. Yeah, yeah hi, I'm curious about the reward. Uh, so that uh, uh, currently uh, most of the research is uh, in reinforcement learning. Uh, they have engineered the reward uh, signal. So is there any like important research and learning the reward uh, automatically like um, without having to engineer the function to generate the signal of the reward or something like that? Um, I guess, you know, there's, there's a whole class of this, which uh, this other chat brought up to do with inverse reinforcement learning and, and trying to learn these things. So it's not something I've, I've done a lot with, so I wouldn't be able to send you a, like a link to any canonical papers, but there has been a lot of work with it. So Can I add to this? I think a couple of two mechanisms for those uh, algorithms called maximum entropy. It uh, has a deep, re a deep maximum entropy kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. kind of a cool application using that in uh, autonomous driving. And this one to how to learn the reward function. And also there's a, uh, a Bayesian uh, kind of um, version of that 
for also learning the reward function. Uh, you can check the maximum entropy in varsity of what's been done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, another thing that's going to check me out is um, there's a guy at ANU named Marcus Hutter. Who's, yeah. Yeah. Who, at ANU. Yeah. At ANU. Yeah. And he does, part of his work has been on um, like knowledge seeking agents so to come up with reward functions which represent how much have you learned and then try and maximize how much you've learned as opposed to one specific thing. So that's cool. worth checking out as well. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a PhD student he has named John something. I'm sorry, John, I can't remember your name. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a huge guy. Sure, so thank you, thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, from your speech, I have got the action reward and the state of a robot. And uh, also, I understand the generator and the discriminator of the advanced network. But I still couldn't get them together. Uh, because you said that uh, it will determine whether it is the real or the simulation. So, uh, so the real is what a human would behave, right? So the simulation is the robot would uh, generate. Uh, but this should be done before the robot. Uh, yeah, I was, I was more meaning in terms of the. Um, okay, so you're asking about the difference between the real and the simulated? Yes, yeah. uh, I can't get uh, exactly what is the simulation. Yeah, so in this case, the, in terms of the, like, what's, what's the difference between the real and the simulated uh, for this adversarial stuff? I was more, less talking about the idea of a human versus a robot, but more what the, if you think about the RGB rendering from a real camera, so a snapshot from a real camera, versus what might be coming from this simulator, it might be a lot simpler in terms of its lighting, in terms of its textures, in terms of the model itself. So the, the, this, this thing in terms of the GAN, which is trying to do the translation, is trying to translate between this maybe very pixely, image of things that is like flat textured, it's from the simulator, maybe it doesn't have parts of the model, it doesn't have textures, and it needs to translate it into an image that came from a real robot, from a real camera. So it's all the, it's all the things that are basically changing that, um, that the perceptual side of things, not the dynamic system, in terms of like what colour is the arm, what colour is arm. Because if you think about, if I train the simulator, say for example I train the simulator this whole system we talked about on the simulated data, and the simulator looked very unrealistic, like it had no texturing, it didn't have lighting, for example, no labeling. If I tried to just directly use that model on a real robot, the differences in the images it's getting are so fundamental that it wouldn't be able to learn. It's basically like you start to see textures and the cabling and you know the writing of KUKA. It's totally, the, the distribution of the images in the real world would be totally different to the distribution of images from the simulator, because they look so different. So the idea of that GAN is to say, can we translate between the two? If in the simulator I put the arm and make it look like this, and I have a picture of the real arm that looks like that, that can be paired data that I can try to, basically it's a form of translation. Can I translate between an emulate, simulated image to a real image? It only covers the perception side. So this generator needs to do things to make that image look real, like drawing on cables or drawing on KUKA. It's not necessarily talking about the dynamics of the system, but it's about translating the, the image. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, that was a great presentation, and yeah. let's all thank Matt. Thank you.